so today I'm going to be talking about uh, mapping wetland vegetation phenology, and this is the first part in a larger study where I'm really trying to understand the necessary sensor resolution requirements for doing this. Wetlands are very important ecosystems to monitor because they provide several ecosystem services. They are important components of the carbon cycle, and they are some of the most biodiverse places on the world and some of the most productive. However, due to their sensitivity to changes in climate and hydroclimate, they are also some of the most endangered ecosystems in the world, and we really need to establish newer ways and better ways to understand how these systems are changing over time and what is influencing these changes. Understanding phenology and mapping phenology in terrestrial ecosystems has been really key to understanding climate change. And that's because phenology is very sensitive to changes in temperature and precipitation. And what I'm meaning by phenology is just the growth cycle of the plants. Um, those are also drivers in wetland environments. However, you have the third driver in inundation regimes, which makes understanding and mapping phenology of wetlands much more complex than terrestrial environments. And current sensors don't necessarily, are not the best for doing that. Uh, once again, the challenges are wetlands are very spatially complex and they are also very temporally dynamic due to this third driver inundation regimes. And to really hit this point home, current global missions do not observe these areas very well because on one hand you have ocean imagers which have many spectral bands and a high revisit time capable of capturing the complex temporal changes but they have a large pixel size, which does not allow you to capture the complex spatial changes in wetlands. And then on the other hand, you have land imagers, which do have the small pixel size needed to capture the spatial variation, but they have fewer spectral bands and a lower revisit time, so you're not as able to capture that temporal change. However, there are new opportunities coming online with the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 sensor. This is a two-part sensor which allows the of a revisit time of five days and a temporal, sorry, and a spatial resolution of 10 meters. Uh, they launched part one of this sensor last year and part two is supposed to be launched later this year. And the goal of this study is really to investigate the temporal resolution requirements needed for mapping veg wetland vegetation phenology um, while still keeping those spatial requirements in mind. I'm doing this using two data sets. One is the SPOT5 take 5 experiment. So prior to launching the first part of Sentinel-2, the European Space Agency actually created an experimental data set by deorbiting the SPOT5 sensor to allow it to simulate Sentinel-2 data so it does have that five-day repeat period and that 10-meter spatial resolution. However, the areas in which these two sensors differ are the, in the spectral resolution as this sensor only collects data in four bands and does not include a blue band. And then I am going to be comparing that to information from a moderate temporal resolution sensor, Landsat, which has a tempo temporal resolution of 16 days and a spatial resolution of 30 meters. Oh, and um, because this is an experimental data set, they only actually acquired data from April to September of uh, 2015, so that's the time constraint for my study site. And there are only 150 of these SPOT5 take 5 study sites and one of them is in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. This is the hub of California's water system and it's a really great area to study this in because it has a large variety of ecosystems within it. So there are wetlands towards the west where you have 
the salt water coming in and tides coming in and their salt marshes. And then towards the middle of the delta, you have areas where fresh water and salt water meet. Uh, there are also just freshwater wetlands. And this area is very heavily managed in certain regions. Uh, there are a lot of water management procedures. And there are also wetlands that are naturally restoring. So this is very representative of several other wetland types. And once you establish methods for this wetland, because it is so diverse, it'll help you understand how to then transfer that to many different types of wetland ecosystems. Within this area, there are three main plant functional types, and they are floating, emergent, and submerged aquatic vegetation. And I'm mainly going to be focusing on the floating and emergent vegetation for developing uh, wetland phenology indicators. In order, the first step of my project was to classify my area, and I did this using a multi-temporal classification, which basically means I took training data from all the dates and put them into a random forest. So now we're going to take a look at one of the managed wetland regions and compare between the moderate spatial resolution and the high spatial resolution for the matchup date that these two data sets share. As you can see, um, there, there's a quite a bit of overestimation going on in the 30 meter spatial resolution, particularly with the submerged aquatic vegetation. But overall, they do share very similar patterns, which is very encouraging. I was able to achieve an overall accuracy of 90% for all dates, um, with exception of the SAV in the beginning of the season. I was a bit lower just because there isn't as much. And now we're going to take a look at an NDVI time series of a region that's just a bit uh, to the left of the one we were just looking at. And just to orient you, the time, the dates on the bottom and NDVI is on the y-axis and the black line is the high temporal resolution sensor and the gray line is the lower one. So you can see you're missing this large drop in the NDVI with the um, lower temporal resolution sensor. And in order to get a better understanding of the overall picture, I sam randomly sampled emergent and floating classes with 1,000 pixels and to orient you once again, dates on the bottom, NDVI on the y-axis, and the areas that are red mean that there's a higher, dent uh, higher amount of pixels that exhibit that NDVI value. So for the emergent class, you can see that there's quite a bit of variability in the NDVI values throughout the entire time series. And this is just for the high temporal resolution sensor. So that might actually indicate that I should refine that class and split it up into more subsets because there are quite a bit of different vegetation emergent types within the ecosystem. And then the floating over here has much less variability and has a higher reflectance around, I'm sorry, a higher NDVI value around 0.8, and that is because those vegetation types tend to be flat and waxy and reflect more. And there is a bit of variability over there, and that could potentially be due to flowering. And now we're going to take a look at one of the areas in the delta that is actually being restored naturally. So I did a very similar thing as to the previous plot, except I just did that for one area rather than the whole delta. And you can start to see that the green up happening at the beginning of the season where the curve bends down a bit. And it does, and I'm doing a comparison here between the high temporal resolution and the moderate temporal resolution. And it's really interesting to see that they are exhibiting a pretty similar 
curve, even though you have much less data for the moderate temporal resolution. I also compared the two floating, the floating, floating class between the two data sets, and they look pretty similar as well. However, in between May and June, you are missing this little bump due to the lack of temporal resolution in the moderate sensor. Um, and something that's really important to look at when you're comparing temporal resolution is the effect of cloud cover. So as I said, you're really seeing very similar patterns between the two data sets. But when you look at cloud cover, you can see that there is a greater influence uh, of a cloudy day in the moderate temporal resolution because we know that this area typically exhibits clouds on the west side, but here you see these red areas mean that that area is clouded very frequently in this time period. So you're, it in, introduces some biases on how you're mapping these areas based on the cloud cover. So even though they look the same, it is nice to have more images in order to better observe uh, how the ecosystem actually looks. So in conclusion, um, Landsat appears to be reasonable at the 16-day repeat period. I would like to do more study on this just to include the winter months and see if that's still the case by comparing a higher temporal resolution and a moderate temporal resolution. Uh, however, Sentinel-2 and the five-day repeat period does have substantial advantages when overcoming cloud cover. And it also has advantages when you're trying to remove the inundation signal in the background, the, the water background of the vegetation because you just have more data and then can establish better methods for removing that signal. Uh, in terms of spatial resolution, when you look at the classification, they do match up pretty well, but you should be careful in some areas with the higher, with the coarser spatial resolution. And I didn't really evaluate spectral resolution in the study, but I'm very excited to use actual Sentinel-2 data as it will allow me to use the blue band and remove some of that background water influence. And I didn't also did not really look at the radiometric resolution, but that is very important to keep in mind for future application. And just to reiterate this, this kind of study is important because it sheds light on how we can use a new sensor, how we can understand the resolution requirements needed to map wetland vegetation phenology, which would be useful for future satellite missions, and it does show us how Landsat can continually be used to better understand our ecosystems. And with that, I would like to thank my lab group and the uh, European Space Agency and CNS for the Spot 5 Take 5 data set and uh, NASA Hispory Preparatory Airpoint, Airpoint activities for providing me with the training data, with some of the training data that I used in my classification because they actually collected field samples. And with that, I will take any questions and or comments.